most notable where I've seen some, some dramatic changes, or great changes rather, was revising the course content where we were using uh, case studies and sort of this flipped classroom model where students read and, and do questions ahead of time to prepare. But when we come to class, we're problem solving. Mm. We're, we're applying it. Hi, I'm Kimberly McCorkle, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academics at East Tennessee State University. From the moment I arrived on this campus, I've been inspired by our faculty, their passion for what they do, their belief in the power of higher education, and the way they are transforming the lives of their students. This podcast is dedicated to them, our incredible faculty at ETSU. Hear their stories as they tell us why I teach. In this episode, we will talk with Dr. Sarone Foster from the ETSU Department of Biological Sciences. Dr. Foster came to this campus several years ago while an undergraduate for a summer research fellowship. Now she calls ETSU home, and a couple of years ago, she was listed among 100 inspiring black scientists in America by the science blog Crosstalk. Enjoy the show. Dr. Foster, thank you for joining me today. I want to begin by talking about our McNair program, which prepares students for graduate school. You were a student in New Jersey when you first heard about the program here at ETSU. Will you walk us through what happened? Sure. I was in my junior year at the College of New Jersey, and I had an advisor who handed me a flyer for the Ronald McNair program at ETSU. And someone gave it to him, so then he gave it to me. He thought that the pro this program would be perfect for me. I did not know where Johnson City was located, so I pulled out a map to see where it was, but we thought that it would be a great experience to go to another institution for the summer as well as engage in uh, undergraduate research. And so I applied and I was accepted, and the coordinator for the program at the time, uh, Mrs. Leslie Glover, she picked me up from the airport with a warm welcome and greeting. And so mm. that was my first introduction to ETSU and Johnson City, and it mm. was perfect. And while I was here over the summer, I met so many other people here. Mr. Steve Ellis, who, who was in at the College of Medicine, but now is pharmacy. Mm. Dr. Dorothy Dobbins, who's now retired, but worked at the College of Medicine and I think sociology. And then the students that I met as well that mm. were ETSU students that were part of the program were also just warm and welcoming. And all of those individuals were still close. This was summer 2000. So 22 years later, we still have a great relationship. And I actually talked with some of them just a few days ago, uh -huh. and we'll see a few of them over the weekend. And so it's, it was just a really great experience that I had. And then, of course, my mentor, can't forget him, Dr. Scott Champany, mm. uh, just his teaching and his style of mentoring is literally ingrained in who I am and how mm. I mentor and teach my students. And he and I still keep in touch as well. So that was, it was a very transformational and awesome experience that summer. It's wonderful. I like to start my podcast with the same question for every guest. Take me back to your first day of teaching at ETSU as a faculty member. Looking back to that day, what's one piece of advice that you would have given yourself? Oh, less is more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so doing a lot less. As a professor teaching an introductory course, there's usually a set curriculum uh, that you need to cover. And it, it was a lot, it was a lot of information. And so then you couple that with students from different educational backgrounds and then poor study skills, it was just rough. And so mm -hmm. I wish I would have learned that it's okay to cut some things out, <laughs> which I end up doing, you know, after that first year or so, worked with the department mm -hmm. even Amy Johnson uh, with the QEP at the time and just redesigning the courses. And so all of that helped to redesign the course and the content. And then we were able to focus on study skills, building skills, building the confidence that students needed, and then transforming the content in a way where they still got the foundational pieces of information, but mm -hmm. those skills became more important because then they were able to pick up a lot of the content that I thought that they were going to miss. And mm. so less is more and finding the right balance in how I teach was, was wish I would have known that. Excellent advice. Tell us about your faculty role in biological sciences. What courses do you teach? 
So my initial appointment began in 2011, 2011 as a lecturer. And then in 2016, um, I began the assistant professor tenure track and received tenure and promoted to associate professor in in, uh, 2021. And so I teach introductory biology one for majors. It's part of a, uh, it's the first course in a three sequence uh, intro course for students. And then I also teach um, a course called supervised teaching. And in the past I taught an upper level biochemistry laboratory course. So you also prepare graduate students who are going to become teachers? Yes, and, and mm-hmm. so the Biology One a Laboratory, it's a component of the course, but it's taught by our master's students. Mm-hmm. And so many of them are working towards going to apply for PhD programs, or they can go into teaching as well at a community college or even at some undergraduate campuses. But I work with them on teaching pedagogy, the strategies in the classroom. They prepare their lectures, they prepare their exams and grade their exams. And so I work with Mm -hmm. them and those skills. And then also because they're first year master's students, many of these students are just graduating from college. Mm -hmm. And so they were once themselves just a few years ago sitting in that same seat. And so it's a daunting task for a new master's student. Um, and so they, it's overwhelming sometimes. And so it's important mm-hmm. that we work with them as a department yeah. uh, and, and helping them navigate those, 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 that transition to teaching. You were telling us earlier that you didn't jump directly into a tenure track position right after finishing your PhD. Talk about where you were when you made the decision to become a college professor. Oh, well, yes, in the classroom. So it wasn't <laughs> until I actually got in, into the classroom doing the thing mm-hmm. that I realized that this, this is for me. And so at the end of my postdoc, I was still weighing options for my career path, which I finished my postdoc over at, at Quillen in the Department of, of Biomedical Sciences in 2011. So I was still weighing options in what I wanted to do. And the college professor was not one of those options, actually. And so I enjoyed teaching because I, as a PhD student, I was a, a teaching assistant in the biology department, actually. And then I also taught at Northeast State for a year as an adjunct faculty when I was a PhD student. So I enjoyed it, but quite hadn't thought that I wanted to do a tenure track position, research Mm -hmm. lab, everything that I'm doing now, I had not thought that I wanted to do that. So I saw the lecture position and I applied as sort of a transition period to give me some downtime to think, okay, well, I could use this downtime to think about next steps, figure out uh, where, where I was going to go next. But boy, was I surprised that when I stepped in that classroom that first semester, and the relationships that I built with students. Mm -hmm. Um, Watching them grow, uh, maybe struggle at first, but then to see them grow, and then working and serving with faculty on campus. All of that coupled together just kind of captured my heart. And I love people, (laughs) I'll talk to anyone. And so I love being on a college campus. It reminded me of when I was in college as well. And so all of those things together, being around on a college campus, working with students, and then still, I was still involved with my research as well. Mm-hmm. And so that after a while, it was evident that this is what I'm called to do mm-hmm. and that this is where I'm supposed to be. That's great. Science can be intimidating for students. And I know that ETSU is a popular destination for students who are seeking careers. Many of these students likely end up in your biology 1110 lecture course. Overall, how many students do you have in this course? And can you estimate how many of those are first time in college freshmen? Yes, so I teach two sections of Biology 1110. Mm -hmm. And and typically um, about maybe 200 to 250 in each section. And that Mm -hmm. has changed over the years. So a total of, you you think 400, so 450 to maybe 500 students total um, that I've had kind of average over the years. Mm -hmm. It's been less, of course, lately since the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but this is just the fall semester. And then typically it's about 70% of those students are first time freshmen. So you Mm -hmm. can think maybe 300, 350 students. And in the spring it's less, we have about 100 students in that class. And most of those students are upper level students that are not biology majors. Many of these students are pre-med, 
pre-nursing, pre-pharmacy, or pre-health sciences. So the grade that they will earn will matter later on when they're applying to these graduate programs. What are the critical study skills that students need to learn in order to be successful in these courses? Yes, you are absolutely right. And so critical reading and critical thinking are absolutely pivotal in in this course. Data analysis Mm -hmm. and application of the content as well, particularly to real world problems that they're gonna be solving in their careers, I would say are major skills that they need um, for some of the majors and careers that you mentioned. You've also done research on student retention. Talk with us about that work. Yes. So after my first year, actually during that first year teaching, I noticed that students were struggling with the skills that that I just mentioned. And so in talking with the students, many of them talked about that their high school preparation Mm -hmm. um, just lacked a lot of these skills. And then it was varied across the board. You have so many students, so you had varied experiences. And then it was also affecting their motivation and their success in the course. And so I really just felt compelled that I needed to do something. And I think that's that scientist in me, mm-hmm. that when, when there's a problem or there's a question at hand, yeah. you wanna fix it and you find answers to those questions to be able to solve the problem. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I, I received some grants from the Tennessee Board of Regents to do sort of course revitalization and implementing some things, and then also a grant from Pearson Biology Mm -hmm. to do some changes. And a few of those, the most notable where I've seen some some dramatic changes, or great changes rather, was revising the course content where we were using uh, case studies Mm -hmm. and sort of this flipped classroom model where students read and, and do questions ahead of time to prepare. But when we come to class, we're problem solving. Mm -hmm. We're, we're applying it. And I could think of one example where we talked about the opioid epidemic and we took a topic from biology Mm -hmm. and applied it to, to drug transport, but had the students write a reflection Mm -hmm. on their lives and their careers and how, what they're learning and what they're doing can intertwine with how they could fix the opioid epidemic Mm -hmm. in their, in their communities. And many of them even shared stories of how their communities and families have been devastated by this. And so Mm -hmm. it was just really transformational for students to see purpose in what they were learning in the classroom. And and we saw that, you know, being able to learn in this manner, we had a decrease in the DF failure rate Mm -hmm. in the class. And then students also were able to to do well on higher level cognitive questions Mm -hmm. on Bloom's taxonomy. And so that was really great to see that kind of data in the class classroom. I've worked with Reza Mosini in Department of Chemistry where we merged some of our content or we synced our content with chemistry and biology. And then we used the Flint, Michigan water crisis as sort of a backdrop to teach both biology and chemistry. So students who were in our classes at the same time We're seeing this example, but seeing the chemistry side of it, Mm -hmm. but then the biology side of it, literally during the same week of classes. And then we would, of course, test the students. And then Reza in his chemistry class saw that there was a 7% increase in the, the, the students take the ACS chemistry final sort of as their final exam. And so this is a national standard exam, but the students had a 7% increase in previous years on this exam. And so we're seeing that you can get results and that students can do well. You just need to work with them and teach them the skills that they need. Met, we talk, we do a lot of metacognitive strategies, teaching students to see how do I learn and to reflect on those. And then um, looking at growth mindset in the classroom. So we incorporate a lot into the classroom that you typically wouldn't think about doing in an intro biology class but that it's absolutely necessary. And then a few things I'll highlight. I've partnered with the CFAA. My class was the first class to sort of introduce the supplemental instruction. And so that was a great experience. And now several classes on campus are using it and it is absolutely pivotal for my class. The students really enjoy that and that's been a big help. And then now we've even upgraded a little bit. I'm working with Florida Uh, persons from Florida Atlantic University, International Mm -hmm. University, as well as Auburn University. So now we're working with students 
on reading primary scientific literature and looking at what are the thinking tools and the strategies and how are they reading science articles, journal articles, and then does this motivate them more to want to do science? And, and that was pivotal because we went from critical reading and struggling with critical reading to now where students are reading journal articles in class. And it's a struggle, but they mm-hmm. keep at it. And so we're looking to see, hopefully this motivates them to want to stay in science and, and do science post their careers. That is such important work in student engagement. Speaking of research, you were recently named Associate Director for Undergraduate Research in our Honors College. Congratulations. Tell us about this new role and why do you feel it is important that we have a robust offering of undergraduate research opportunities across the university? Yes, thank you so much. I am really excited about this new role. It really encompasses everything that I love and that I'm passionate about. Um, One of the main roles is to increase the number of students participating in undergraduate research and creative activities across campus in all disciplines, and then also assisting faculty on how to create these mentored uh, research experiences or creative experiences for students as well. It's important, I believe, to offer these types of research experiences and creative experiences on campus because the data shows from uh, numerous colleges across the country that it's strong data showing that students who engage in undergraduate research or a mentored experience, you have higher retention, their persistence towards graduation is, is better, you have a greater sense of belonging on campus, the students apply to graduate programs, or that they have built these skills and they're better prepared for their careers once graduating. And so I would love, if I kind of had a big wish list, I would love to see all first and second year students engaged in some kind of undergraduate or creative activity research experience in all the disciplines across campus. And then the benefits for faculty, because you have a student working with you, they're producing scholarly work. And Mm -hmm. so this is helping the faculty with their research and then contributing to that area. And then I think the benefits to the university, um, you now have more engaged alumni. I can think from from my students and even my colleagues and how they engage with their students. Those students have our cell phone numbers while Mm -hmm. they're here. And so once they graduate, those numbers stay the same. And Mm -hmm. so we keep in contact with them. I know my students still call for advice as they're navigating their careers. If I'm in town where they live, I call them, we get together, we have lunch. Mm -hmm. And so it's still, it's a lifelong connection that you have now gained with students that you may not otherwise have from simply just having a student uh, in class. And so I think that's really important. So everyone wins in this. It's beneficial for the university, the student, the peers, the engagement. And then also, uh, we also have another, a second associate director Bill Duncan, who is looking, um, who's working with undergraduate research in global context. And so now we're wanting to even not just engage students on campus, but then looking at global opportunities and for them to go abroad and do research as well. So I'm really excited about where we're going and what we're wanting to do here. It's fantastic. With hundreds of our students in your courses and with your new role in the Honors College, Tell us how you find time to continue your own research. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, I, I do. I, I do. I currently have a grant from the American Heart Association, and so I'm studying the impacts of estrogen loss and aging on heart failure. And it's a tight balance uh, to find time to write grants, to teach, to work in the lab. But I get it done, and, and it's because of my students. We, we help each other. We work as a team to get things done. We have calendars and spreadsheets to help keep us organized. But this yeah. is one example of a career readiness skill of this team building, this organization, and this management that the students are learning and having to keep up with their, their busy professor. But I love it. It's all intertwined. And I still get in the lab, and I'm in there 
ha hands. I get my hands dirty with the students working alongside <laughs> of them. I love to put on my sweats and some tennis shoes, pull my <laughs> hair back and, and sort of feel like I'm a student working in there with them. Uh, and so we, we get it done and it really is an honor to, to work with them. But all of it connects too with, with the role that I have as associate director. So it doesn't seem, seems like a lot, but it, it's all intertwined. And so I think it's mm -hmm. a cohesive unit in, in all that I do with the students and the, the teaching and now associate director. So, so it all kind of comes together. It's wonderful. I was going to say synergy just then as you were describing mm -hmm. like all of it that when there's a synergy yes that's a good it's word. just it, it makes sense it works mm -hmm. that that all of the activities that you're performing are connected through mm -hmm. the synergy and that's mm -hmm. how it works mm -hmm. when I opened the podcast I referenced the crosstalk listing that named you among the 100 inspiring black scientists will you tell us a little bit more about that yes this was this was an honor I think about the black scientists that came before me. Many did not have the freedoms that I do, that I have today to be able to attend school wherever I want to and study wherever I want to. And they overcame a great deal of discrimination and barriers in order to achieve their goals. And so I do not take lightly that I stand on the shoulders of, of those that came before me that paved the way and the role that I now have to be an example to others. So this was definitely an honor to be recognized with my colleagues of today, of, of some of the other, of many of the other black scientists who were recognized and the role that we play. I'm also the first person in my family to attend college as well as the first person to earn a PhD. And so often you do not have examples or role models and I did not have any scientists in my family or, or even around in my community uh, to sort of show and pave that way. And so sometimes it becomes difficult, but what I had was great teachers mm -hmm. and who, who recognized something in me, my mm -hmm. talent to be able to do a math problem easily without effort and say, oh, you're really good at math and I think you should think about science mm -hmm. and sign me up for a pre-college program yeah. at the at the local college and and yeah. this was at 12 and i have been doing oh. science since the age of 12 and i guess how long i can tell my age but 30 years 30 <laughs> plus years that 31 years i've been doing this wow all because of of teachers and 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 knowing that there were others before me who paved the way so i don't take that lightly and then i also know that um, being in STEM and being a, a, a black female in STEM, that there are not a lot of faces or not a lot of African-American women in, in the sciences. And so when I have students who are aspiring to be in, in the science and technology or engineering and math fields, I know that, that they see me and it's, oh, I can do it too. Because I've had students tell me, I've had their parents you know, also, you know, when they come for visits on campus and that they mm -hmm. see that there's a black female scientist on campus yeah. and that their students are wanting to pursue those fields that that they see that, oh, I can do it too. Or that if they they come across any of the ises, isms that we have or racism, sexism, or unfortunately, some of those things that still occur in our society that if, if students come across that, it could be discouraging, but when they see others have overcome those things, it's encouraging. So it's really important that you have a, a network. And it's important for our students to be able to engage and to be able to see this. And we learn from one another. And while we're working in the lab, I, I tell my students that your role, all of my students, no matter what your background, where you come from, that our job is to make sure that this world is better and that mm -hmm. we get rid of all of those is is isms and those things that are, are happening that's not good for society. Mm -hmm. that's, I love that. Thank you for sharing. The last question for every guest, what impact do you hope your students will make on the world? Oh, I have, I teach a seminar, and this actually was sort of birthed out of my, my interview for the um, associate director, but I teach a, a seminar and work with students, and it's titled Movers and Shakers, Becoming Students of Impact and Influence. Mm. So I, I tell my students that you are next in line 
to lead this world and you will be making decisions that will affect the lives of others. And, and you want to be a, a good steward of that, that all you've been given and that you've learned while you're here at ETSU. And so you bear the responsibility to pass on what you've gained to the next person and the next generation. And so I tell them, shake stuff up. You know, if it's not right, you have a responsibility to speak up and fix it. And so that's what I hope and the, and the impact that they will have in this world. Thank you, Dr. Foster. We are so glad that you made the decision to come to ETSU for our McNair program when you are still an undergraduate student. It was certainly a life-changing opportunity for you, but it was also a transformative moment for ETSU. Thank you for being a champion for our aspiring scientists and rising healthcare providers. We especially thank you for your work to help our students be successful in all that they do. Thanks for listening to Why I Teach. For more information on Dr. Foster or this podcast series, visit the ETSU Provost website at etsu.edu slash provost. You can follow me on Twitter at ETSU Provost. And if you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like and subscribe to Why I Teach wherever you listen to your podcasts.